So I'm here today with uh, Professor Sean McGrath. And Sean, it's uh, great to have you on the podcast. I really appreciate you making the time for this. Great to be here. Okay, so a little background. I first heard you on a podcast called Psychology and the Cross. And uh, I was uh, really struck by some of the things you had to say, particularly about uh, Jung psychology and Christianity. And um, it's an area that I've been exploring lately. And so I really wanted to have you on the podcast. And with the added bonus that you're a Canadian professor, uh, which is great. I think we need more Canadian voices other than Jordan Peterson talking about psychology and Christianity and religion, those kind of things. So I wanted to give a platform for your voice because I think um, you have a unique voice and uh, you speak with some authority based on your background. So maybe a great place for us to start is if you could offer a little bit of that background, your journey to becoming a professor of philosophy and theology. Sure. I I didn't go directly at it. I, I entered a religious order right after undergrad. Uh, contemplative Catholic religious order living off grid in Nova Scotia. And uh, for five years, I was a monk and lived in the Middle Ages. And uh, after five years, I went to graduate school. I left the order, went to graduate school and did my graduate degrees in philosophy and theology. And that was about seven years at, in Toronto uh, and in Germany. <clears throat> philosophy of religion, you know, medieval philosophy, sorting out the things that I had learned in the monastery and, and expanding them with my discovery of things that I didn't learn, for example, Protestantism, which uh, interested me greatly and continues to. And then after that, when I was a, a newbie uh, in the university world, I, I picked up on, I, I began to teach Jung because I'd, I had read Jung in the monastery to sort out my life. Um, there are some rough waters, as there always is, in a novitiate, and Jung was an immense help to me. And uh, so, once I entered, you know, once I got a position to to go more deeply into it, I did. I started by teaching it, and then I began proposing research projects in it. And the research project led to uh, immersion. So I, I entered the C.G. Jung Institute as a, a training candidate, and I went. I was there four years. I got halfway through their program. I did their so-called propedeuticum, and uh, got out uh, before finishing the practicum because I realized that my calling was to be a professor and not a therapist. And I had done what I needed to do there. Hmm. Now was, sorry, was reading young, that that's something to do with you leaving the monastery? In some ways, in some ways, um, it had more to do with me sorting out, you know, my sexuality, my, I was 23 years old and I was living a celibate contemplative life and uh, fell in love and uh, couldn't understand how my religious commitments could be so upended uh, by a young woman. Hmm. You know, I, I was completely out of my mind and I, I didn't know what was going on. So it was actually the, the union teaching on love and the relations between the sexes and the animal animus matrix that really opened my eyes. Uh, so I, I didn't actually intend to leave because of Jung. It was more, uh, I, I'm, I'm, in fact, I found a, a way to stay. Uh, but what, what really drove me out was a desire to do more scholarly work. And that wasn't our calling. Uh, we were called to a, a, a very simple contemplative life following the Carmelite tradition. Most of my life would have been manual labor. I would have had a couple hours, maybe a day for intellectual work, but I, I wanted to go more deeply into everything. I had lots of questions. I was getting up early in the morning and instead of reading John of the Cross, I was reading existential philosophy, things like that. And so uh, I, I just had to follow this you know, book. Mm. A vocation comes from within and something was driving me um, into scholarship. And that's that was the main reason to leave. But I never really left. I'm still a monk in many ways. I'm a married man. I have a son. But I be, what I learned then, my contemplative life, the contemplative practice I learned, and my appreciation for contemplative Christianity has, has never has never diminished, not at all. It's only enriched. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's been interesting as we've been corresponding to set this up. Uh, you keep sending me 
messages from, you know, I just got back from the woods. I was out in a canoe for four days. And uh, so very much uh, like a kind of pastoral monkish life, if it is one, like uh, communing with nature, like St. Francis or something. That's how I imagine you <laughs> out there in the wilds of Newfoundland. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm getting, I'm 55, so I've been at this academic gig for quite a while, and I'm beginning to think that there's another life um, after this, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I, I might just find myself, uh, um, I don't know, spending much more time out in the woods in the, in the years to come. That would suit me well. Hmm. I've been, uh, as I've been wrestling with my own Christianity <clears throat> past couple of years, uh, you know, I'll go to a church and like, give it a give it a go see if it see if i'm a good fit for it or if it's a good fit for me mm -hmm. um and not having found a home in any church so far the idea of a new christianity that um is like you know two or three gathering in some natural place to uh break some bread maybe share some wine and uh some discussion around a fire sounds the most appealing to me and uh yeah, I wonder if maybe that's something you could get going out there. Absolutely. In fact, uh, it wouldn't be the first time mass was said on the deck of my off-grid cabin for a couple of people. So come on out. Oh, wow. something. You're already doing it. That's great. Um, okay. So I think maybe you've answered this already, but one of my first questions was, uh, you know, I've heard you say that you're specifically a Christian theologian, uh, but I was wondering if you consider yourself a Christian. And I think the answer is yes, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A contemplative, so not... a contemplative Christian. Yeah. Multi-confessional at home and multi, multi, you know, I'm ca Catholic by training and birth. Um, so, you know, my, 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 my psyche is Catholic. That's how the Catholics do it. They get you in your the baby and they shape your mind. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, in terms of my theology, probably more inclined towards Protestantism and uh, certainly fascinated by all things ancient Greek. So Eastern Orthodox is also of, of interest to me. So I, I consider myself to be sort of a Christian who's in, a, who a lot, who's in alignment with anyone who regards the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon as determinative of Christianity, whether pro or contra, but any, anyone who finds those basic ancient councils in which the doctrine of the incarnation and the doctrines of the Trinity and were defined and for any any group for whom those are somehow foundational um i'm more or less aligned with them hmm. when you say uh contemplative christianity is that something specific uh because i mean my kind of contact with that is through maybe someone like richard Rohr or uh cynthia cynthia bourgeau who i think are quite different but maybe both could be considered contemplative Christians, mm. but uh, I, I haven't been able to find anything resembling a uh, kind of a, um, a kind of a, a clear defined practice that would define one as a contemplative Christian. I mean, it just seems to me like a umbrella term. I'm not sure what it actually mm. means. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I think what's happened is that there's been a great decline in contemplative Christianity and generally in contemplative culture in the West and in European and post-European societies, a great, great decline, not only in, in uh, Christianity, but also in other dimensions of life, whether it's rural life or just a, we've, 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 we've just fallen very far. So Richard Rohr, for example, has gone very far in, in, in resisting that decline. And he's made the term um, at least somewhat mainstream um, what Rohr teaches is essentially what, uh, what the contemplative Christians all through the ages have taught. So Rohr is not doing anything particularly innovative. And contemplative Christians know that contemplative Christianity is not a, a version of Christianity or a marginal thing or a, a, a revision. It's actually the central, central or, piece. Of or it. an alternative to it's not the an alternative. Yeah. institutional churches. It isn't an alternative. It runs right through the institutions all the way back. So there, it, it depends on how much you know about history. But, you know, the New Testament, for example, the letters of St. Paul or the, or the letters of John for, and the Gospel of John, they, these really cannot be understood in any other way than as, than as writings of contemplative religion. Or if you want mystical, that's the heart of the gospel. Now, that's not widely recognized, but that 
remains the case. And people like Thomas Merton spent their 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 life uh, trying to remind people of that. And it just it's just continually being forgotten. So I consider myself as lending my small efforts to the task of remembering the contemplative mystical heart of the Christian gospel. And that allows us to, to put the gospel into alignment with things that many people know much more about. For example, um, Mahayana Buddhism or Zen Buddhism, or even shamanism, if you want, um, we, we can find all kinds of interesting ways in which the gospel uh, can be understood uh, and reanimated and reactualized um, through these through these non-Christian and non and, and non-Western lenses. Um, there is uh, no question in my mind that uh, the forgetting of the mystical contemplative core of Christianity is one of the great um, uh, one of the great failures of the West and it's at the heart of many other problems including ecology, economy and so on. Mm. I suppose uh, I wasn't aware of it until you started talking about it, but I think maybe I had some conception of contemplative Christianity as um, being a, a version of Christianity that was trying to be ecumenical, that was importing uh, meditation practices from the East, Christianizing them in some way, so that a contemplative Christian would have a practice of, say, prayer of the heart or something like that. But the picture that's forming in my mind as you speak is that contemplation is maybe best understood as someone who is wrestling with uh, ideas of, about religion and personal relationship with uh, Christ or God, uh, that it sounds like it's more of um, an internal working out of things. Uh, so it's, it sounds to me like quite active and engaged well, there's certainly, you know, there's there's practices, there's techniques, but it's it's much less technique oriented than some forms of Buddhism. But there's also forms of Buddhism that are far less technique oriented, and there's some interesting parallels there. You know, you wrote, you mentioned the Jesus Prayer, the Hesychist tradition. There's an excellent example of a Christian contemplative practice. But there are other things, uh, and the Benedictine monasticism is a kind of placeholder for many of these practices. So the practice of Lexio Divina, which is something extremely important to me, which means you start your day reading, but you read in a different way. You're reading meditatively. You're reading in a, typically it was script, scripture and it often is for me, but it, it can be anything. So long as the reading is not for the sake of distraction or information or, or scholarly work or something like that, but it's actually for nourishing and inspiring you so that the, you can hear the voice of God through the, through the sacred texts. So um, there are there are other practices as well. Certainly, the mass and the liturgy. You know, the, the, the liturgy is a really a poetic text that has been composed by countless writers over the course of two thousand years. Many of these prayers are very ancient, and they put us in alignment with uh, Byzantium, with ancient Greece, with Alexander, with lost places and and lost figures and lost philosophers and theologians who were all in one, one way or another, they were all mystics and contemplatives. And they, these, these prayers were intended to bring about an experience of, of intimacy with, with the Christ, not to raise yourself up above humanity because you don't need to do that because the Christ has actually entered into humanity, which means there's no need for a technique to transcend your human being. Mm -hmm. uh, there's really rather just a, a, a practice of, of reception and openness and, uh, um, recognizing that it's an, um, there's another power moving through you and moving through history. And once you begin to trust in this power and, and less on yourself, uh, you begin to see that the scriptures are actually accounts of human experiences of Christ nature. Hmm. <laughs> I know much more about yoga than I do Christianity. I'm, I'm trying to get caught up in the Christianity thing. Um, in order to reckon with my own uh, kind of ancestral lineage, let's say, and uh, my own personal experiences, which have been surprising and confounding to me as someone who wasn't seeking Christ. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm seeing a lot of parallels actually with uh, the path in yoga called Kriya Yoga, which would be the yoga of action. And um, I think about Richard Rohr's Center for Action and Contemplation, mm, Kriya, action, interesting. 
But the three pillars of that practice is tapas, vajaya, and ishvara, pranidhana. Tapas is like asceticism, um, so fasting or moderation in food, uh, but would also include something like a mantra repetition. Uh, Svadhyaya is what you're talking about with reading the spiritual texts and using that as a way of self-reflection and intimacy with uh, the divine. Ishvara Pranidhana is, uh, well, like a surrender to that. Uh, it sounds like contemplative Christianity has very similar parallels in terms of uh, practice. Well, I think the, the, when you want to find the unity of religion, you need to look at the contemplative side of every religion. And, you know, not all of Hinduism is contemplative. Not all Hindus are, 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 are yogis. So, and it's, it's true, and it's also the case with Buddhists and Taoists and Confucianists. Mm -hmm. But when, when you go into the contemplative traditions of each of these, and by contemplation, we really simply mean um, an experience, an experiential account or an account of experience, of religious experience. Religion, not as a matter of propositions primarily, but as a matter of experience. And, a, and of an experience of transformation and transcendence. And, and then we're very much on some pretty common ground where we can start to read, you know, Dogen from medieval Japan or Shankara from medieval India. And you can, we, we, we begin to see that actually, although these are not the same thing and these discourses should not be collapsed into each other, mm -hmm. but there is a kind of common human gathering around the mystery, you could say, of the origin and the destiny of human being, which includes us and includes you and me as, as, as the finite persons that we are. So I, I think the contemplative Christian thing is very simple, and it's so simple, that's why we keep missing it. A any Christian who has an active prayer life is a contemplative Christian. There are many Christians who don't have an active prayer life. That mm. is, cr for them, Christianity is a matter of morals or uh, family tradition or, you know, the right thing to do. Uh, but, but, but any Christian for whom prayer and the, and the interior life uh, plays a role is a contemplative. So if, if, if you go to a, a Catholic uh, church on a weekday, weekday mass, you know, 8 a.m. or whatever, you'll find people there who are praying. Um, you don't necessarily see so many of them on Sunday. Um, maybe older people, who, who knows who they are, someone who's perhaps finding, maybe somebody who just likes the quiet space of the church. Let's not forget that these churches are some of the last refuges in cities where there's no commerce, you know, the church is a public space. It's mm. it's a place without it's it's a non-capitalized space. It's a place for prayer. And previously, the doors were always open. That's less and less the case now. But mm -hmm. European cities, for example, have had wonderful times wandering around Paris or or Rome or Florence and just nipping into a small medieval church in the middle of a hot day and just sitting in the cool silence with the great ancient stones around me and the symbols of the tradition pouring down on me through the stained glass window and entering into a state of prayer. That's, that's a mm. very common thing. And anyone for whom Christianity is a serious thing will, will know that. Now, I, I spoke about church and it's not, of course, essentially bound up with church. Churches have come and gone and they look different in the first century than they do now. And they're gonna look different a century from now. So the church, you know, we, we shouldn't get fixated on buildings and structures and mm vestments and orders and so on all these things are necessary in a certain way but none of them are essential if that makes any sense there's always going to be yeah. something like that kind of structure but it's not, it's going to change you know? I, yeah, i'm not sure if there always will be something like those structures like you know the the catholic churches or maybe you know some of the older anglican churches that we have here on the islands very anglican here but uh uh, those are like kind of like you said an oasis in this sea of commerce and you know mm -hmm. billboards shouting at you everything That's vying right. for your attention you know um i have some amazing memories of the experience that you're describing here when my wife and i lived for a couple of years in montreal and montreal is one of the older canadian cities and uh it's, you know there's a church on every corner basically yes. <laughs> and i used to love uh i taught a corporate yoga class right in the you know, the, the financial district, business district in Montreal, downtown Montreal, which is just so busy and hub. But I, after the class, I would always go across the street to go sit in the Catholic church. And it was exactly like you described the, the coolness, the quietude. And um, whenever I'd go into one of the little side rooms, I don't know what you call them, but um, be like a little smaller room with side some pews. Chapter, yeah. 
Yeah. A little Maybe side ch chapel. Little side chapel. Yeah. yeah. But like you said, middle of the day during the week, there'd always be people in there um, sitting quietly. Um, yeah. it, it was beautiful. That's, and there that's, was no, there's no dog. Yeah, that's European yoga. I get it, man. I get it. And yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, to think that that is going away or that they're, they're keeping the doors locked during the week. Um, it's been difficult. Like my wife and I moved here to Victoria right at the beginning of COVID. And, uh, you know, I was looking for churches to go check out and most of them were closed down, not doing in-person masses and things like that. And everything was going to zoom. And then it seems like even after the, the danger of the pandemic is subsiding, that out of convenience sake, like people realize, oh, it's just so much more convenient to do things online. Yes. Uh, there's more resistance to going back to in-person, but we miss that essential yeah. experience. And it's going to break out in other places. What I meant by saying necessary but not essential is that people will organize themselves somehow, you know, and that's already happened. There's interesting movements happening like uh, urban monasticism. Um, so uh, in, in big cities in the U.S., um, a community of people, families deciding to actually live a common life in a certain way in an apartment building or an apartment block, which means that they 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 undertake they go through they commit to one another in a certain way they might even take vows and pool resources and help the weakest among them and and gather together for something like liturgy and it might be a mass it might be meditation um, and a common meal and th th that kind of structure i mean that's it's so jesus that's so new testament that's what we read about in the new testament and this is the core this is the very heart of liturgy uh, there, there's going to be some practice of common symbols. Symbols are very important, as you know from the yoga tradition. What, where would we be without them? And there's going to be a, a, a space of being together, which has a focus not on socializing necessarily or on commerce or anything else, but on this common shared interior path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's happening in different places, and I think the environmental movement is constantly seeing little eruptions of, of something quasi liturgical and contemplative, maybe focused on nature. But it's it's very hard for environmentalists to stay, you know, hardcore natural scientific about ecology, because the values that are evoked and the commitment and the the, the love for the beauty of the natural world and the the moral indignation at what's happening to it and the sense of, for of reverence and awe for the world that we're uh, that we are so badly abusing these are this bring people in this brings people into the space of of the religious hmm. yeah and yet there's uh there's this i don't know if it's growing or not but there's we live in a, a kind of mostly secular culture now I, I don't know if it's safe to say that it seems quite secular and in the ecology movement what i see um, you know, people talking about we need a new mythology to live by one that is uh, cosmological, that uh, includes all the things you talked about, like the wonder and awe of nature and seeing the interconnectedness of all things. But we're not going to do it with any religious symbols or without any religious doctrine. It's going to be like kind of a secular e uh, eco religion, maybe mm -hmm. like um, mm -hmm. Brian Swim or someone like that. Um, I, know, I know the figure, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that that's enough to to get us through? Like, because then we don't, the, the only symbol is like that photo of the earth from space. You yes, know what right. I mean? No, no, we're symbolic animals and we, we will find our symbols to gather around. Something, something will constellate itself. But the, the question of the secular is extremely interesting to me and I've written a fair bit about it. But essentially, I don't believe that Christianity is opposed to secularism. I think Christianity is self-secularizing and in some respects, Christianity is the is the origin of the secular. Not to say that the secularism we have now is correctly thematized or um, adequate to to itself. Um, but the, the the what is what is at the heart of the secular? It's the sense that the sacred and the the distinction between the sacred and the profane, which is a perennial distinction as old as human beings, uh, is no longer um, pertinent. That there, there, there really is no boundary anymore. And this mm -hmm. can be played in two different ways. One, you could say now everything's profane, you know, more or less the sacred is gone, God is dead. Or you could play it the other way, which is the much more, you know, 
contemplative Christian, maybe Mahayana Buddhist way to play it, well, is that everything is sacred. <laughs> every like, task, every act. Yeah, but the old saying goes, if everything's sacred, if there are no boundaries to the sacred, then actually nothing is then sacred yeah. because it's the boundaries that make the thing sacred. It's yeah. the distinctions, right? There's definitely a logic to it. Yeah, but it's uh, it's truly striking when you read the history of secularism, European secularism, to see how deeply motivated they were by Christian commitments. So, for example, the priesthood of all believers, that we don't need priests above us, mediating for us uh, divinity. We have all become... Uh, adequate to it through the Christ. Christ is the only thing we need, and Christ is the mediator. Christ is everywhere. And if you look at the inaugural moments in the life of Jesus, uh, they are profoundly ordinary everyday moments. You know, think of the great seven signs in the Gospel of John. The first one is turning water into wine at a at a wedding, you know, mm -hmm. at a party. At a party. Uh, <laughs> it's, and, it's, and, and it continues at the Eucharist. G uh, Jesus was a great host. How's that for he a was, pun? He was a great host. And he, <laughs> he seems to have, the significance of the figure seems to have been to enter into each of these moments, these, these spaces of the profane, whether it's childbirth, um, marriage, uh, friendship, uh, work, and to render them capex day, that the divine is there. It's kind of an invasion of divinity into the everyday. And it creates this crisis, as you said, this crisis where uh, the sacred disappears and we suddenly become godless. But this can, this can be easily turned around. And this is why the contemplative is so important into the other insight that actually everything is sacred. And there's, there's no method needed, there's no technique, there's nowhere to go and there's nothing to reach for because it is a divine suffused uh, existence that we are we are involved in. There's nowhere to go. And so my work, my work, my love, my my context, my community, all of that is enough. And that's mm. a very monastic practice. You know, monks live very ordinary lives. You know, it's mm -hmm. just ordinary stuff uh, becoming in some how in some way um, theophanic, revelatory through the practice of attention, through dignifying every ordinary act with a kind of reverence and attention that this too is of God. This too is the site of revelation. This is the place where Christ is right now, you know, in the workshop, at the computer. Uh, yeah, you're sounding a lot like a non-dualist there when you say there's there's nowhere to go, there's nothing to do, it's it, all well, here. I think Christianity is fundamentally non-dualist. I think there's a whole non-dualistic logic that runs through Christianity from the incarnation to the Trinity. Uh, it can only be understood non-dualistically. Yeah, I, I hear you. Uh, at the same time, I, I wonder then, because often what happens in the non-dualist, especially like Neo-Advaita, the way it's been interpreted in the West, like we kind of mess everything up <laughs> when yeah. we import things. But then what happens is that there is no practice. There is no uh, shared ritual. There are no symbols. And I don't know where that leaves us. It, it doesn't sound like a very enticing way to go for me because I love all of those things and ritual to me helps renew the engagement with the divine, like as the kind of remembrance or at least something to share with others. So we're not just sitting around in hammocks going, well, there's nothing to do. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> well, Non-dualism is the most difficult of all practices. And it's, there are so many ways to go wrong with this. And the, the Indian tradition and the Buddhist tradition is full of fascinating discourses on this topic. But my understanding is that the highest form of non-duality is, is the, the non-duality of the non-dual and the dual. So the non-dualist who goes who, yeah. who who believes that the exclusion of mm -hmm. so-called dualistic thinking, whether that's uh, creator God or um, um, practices of uh, pra or, or the distinction between delusion and enlightenment, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. this kind of exclusionary logic immediately betrays the practice. Right. So the non-dualist, <laughs> by very by virtue of the logic of non-duality, has to come around to affirming a kind of everyday a sense of two-ness, which is not two. So, you know, God and God and creation are not two and they're not one. That's the that is a true non-dual Christian insight. Yeah, beautiful so we, paradox. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can't therefore say there's no God, there's just this here and now. This would be a kind of exclusion, which is 
intrinsically, I think, dualistic in the wrong sense. So I like to think of coming back to the symbols through a kind of non-dualistic detour, which breaks up our propositional attachments and our fixations on, you know, oh, we got to get somewhere. It's got to go. I'm going to after death. I'm going to see Jesus, and you know, I'm going to be enlightened after so many lifetimes. And if I just practice hard enough, and if I sit up, sit down and watch my breath and don't get distracted, all this kind of nonsense, you know, we have to kind of break that apart. And non-dualism is the is the uh, is the it's a, the negative moment we need, but I think mm -hmm. there's something to be achieved on the other side of that, which is a return to the symbolic mm -hmm. and now recognizing it for what it is, that this is the, that the, it becomes alive. Then, huh? Yeah, I think that's so great. I I, I think uh, yeah, thinking of the event of the non-dual experience as a point in a, a kind of journey. And then there's the return coming back to dualism, having had that experience being um, the softening of all the attachments and rigidity and thinking about what's right and what's wrong in terms of forms. And coming back to that with a more relaxed attitude allows you to um, be more greatly renewed by the experience of ritual and symbol, and also just like enjoying it and then uh, appreciating the beauty of it for what it is rather, yeah, well, I, I think that's a, great. A, a, never... a lightness, right? There's a light, yeah. one becomes lighthearted about this. You know that this is not the this is not uh, this is not my salvation. This technique, this practice, this symbol system, all of this too should be negated in some respects. But it also has its place. You know, mm -hmm. we're not always in the space of ecstasy, and when we're not, we need those symbols. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, those reminders. Right. Mm -hmm. Now that experience of uh, like the revelation of oneness. I've heard you talk about grace before, and um, grace has been a concept I've been wrestling with and really trying to understand from the Christian perspective and trying to kind of parse it with my understanding from Eastern perspectives. But could you talk a little bit about grace? Like, if we don't do a practice, can we ever have that moment of enlightenment of revelation? Don't we have to be doing something? Or do we sit around and go, okay, it's all good. I just have to wait for grace. Like, do we have to somehow invite grace? Or to like raise our hand in the astral plane and say, "Hey, <laughs> I need a little help here." <laughs> yeah, grace is grace is like non-dualism. It's one of those tricky things that can be so badly misinterpreted and has been, you know, some kind of intervention. You know, like God shoots us a ray of help every now and then because we're screwing up or something. Yeah, not at, not at all. This that's not all at all. Paul's sense of grace. He's the first hmm. to use the term. term. Grace. Uh, is is well as the Eastern Orthodox discuss it. It's the energies of the Godhead pervading creation. So it's the presence of God in everything. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's inescapable. It's always victorious. It ha it can only it can only be defeated by one thing. That is the one who refuses it. Who record who and to refuse grace is to say I can do this on my own. So it's what Shinran calls you know self power. Self power is the only thing that can. Uh, the only obstacle, and even that's not an obstacle, because grace will come around and correct you anyway. You'll fall on your face and discover that actually you can't do it on your own. So gr grace is mm. really the other power that is carrying us, and you could call it on the you know the 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 super conscious, if you like. You know, if we want to talk in a psychoanalytical re register, it's certainly something that's outside of consciousness. It's non-egoic. So when we feel ourselves rescued by something, a dream by. Uh, revelation, a, um, a conversion experience, even just a birth of a new sense of ourself, something that comes from outside what we think we are. That's, that's what Paul means by grace. And mm. Paul's message is that this grace is, uh, as I said, everywhere and always victorious. And if you're tech, and, and it becomes a way of, of, of avoiding the, the improper approach to the symbolic life, um, because one must always remember that these techniques, these symbols, these practices, these efforts you're making, they're really um, uh, it, totally inadequate to the end. You're, you're, you're never, you're never going to perfect yourself. You're not going to div divinize yourself, and you don't have to. It's already been done. So that they, they become more like practices of remembering them when we can make that detour the symbolic life, the propositional practices, whatever the techniques, the practices of recalling and remembering that, hey, it's already been done. It's been, but mm -hmm. we, we've got to avoid what Bonhoeffer calls uh, cheap grace or 
Yeah, and the cost of discipleship. I mean, yeah, there's a way in which, and Paul was dealing with this too. Paul's in the in uh, Galatians. Paul is dealing with a group of people who think, oh, we can do whatever we want. Christ has redeemed us, redeemed the world, and we are destined for life, immortal life, and now we can sin. Right. This <laughs> is like the, what happens to some non-dualists when they take yes. it up in a kind of uh, naive way or something. Exactly. Yeah. That's what this, this is exactly the point, I think. To get out like, a jail no. free card. Yeah, no, no, no. The point is that you've got to keep completely vigilant. So it's this paradoxical, uh, constant vigilance, mm. but never, never forgetting that everything depends on you remembering that nothing depends on you. And I think this is what the practices do. They constantly bring, often through failure, through our failure to do them very well, they bring it to our, bring it back to mind that actually <laughs> nothing depends on me. And if it did, I'm doomed. <laughs> Right. Yeah, my striving is futile. Uh, it puts me in my right place. Yeah, I mean, this is, I'm seeing so much like in particularly the yoga of Patanjali. Um, he says very much exactly what you said. The moment you think you've got it is the moment to be most vigilant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's very psychologically astute, too. I think mm -hmm. Jung would pick up on that and say, hmm, he's on to something there. Yeah. You know. And yeah. also this idea of the Ishvara Pranidhana of surrendering, ultimately recognizing that you're not in control of any outcome. So yes. it's a it's a stance of humility, you know. And it's and it has to be renewed every hour because we're in the grip of an <laughs> an egomaniasm that that doesn't go away, and that's what that's yeah. what Paul calls sin. It doesn't go away; it's just constantly there. So. Huh. So the so the so one 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 then gets to the point of saying, well, I, I'm simultaneously sinner and saved, as Luther puts it. There's another fabulous non-dual moment mm. in the Christian tradition. Mm. Simultaneously sinner and saved. My salvation is not incompatible with my being a miserable sinner. These <laughs> are not two, you know. So uh, yeah, well, I have to be the miserable sinner in order to be saved. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And, and oh, the salvation so actually is, is is the experience of salvation is the illumination of your sinfulness. This is something that's very interesting. Is the keen sense of of, of sinfulness and uh, failure that the saints have. And I, I've noticed this in uh, accounts of other, uh, particularly Buddhist uh, traditions. Uh, I'm thinking of Shinran, who's current fascination of mine. You know, just keen, keen sense of their inadequacy and their incapacity on their own by their efforts to make themselves better. Uh, that seems to be um, uh, simultaneous with the experience of grace and psychologically accepting this kind of uh, moral impotence and finitude is absolutely essential in the contemplative life. One can't go further, very far without it. Mm. Yeah, it reminds me of what Jung said. He said, uh, <laughs> I'll paraphrase, but, uh, I'd rather be whole than try to be good. Yeah. Something like that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the I shadow, Jung would call about, talk about the shadow and, you know, our egos have this shadow, this disavowed other side to them, which we project onto others. And how do you get to know, how do you come to know who your shadow is? Well, you find out what it is that really bugs you. What it is, who are the people that annoy you? What, what, what do you find repellent? What repels you? What gets your gyre, uh, your ire up, you know? And there, uh, invariably, Jung will say, we find disowned aspects of ourselves projected onto others. Maybe there's something there in the other person that elicits the projection. But the emotion, the attachment, the negative attachment, you know, the aversion, the hate, um, this, is, uh, this is an experience of a disavowed shadow. And the acceptance of it is not permission. It's not like, oh, now I'll just be my worst self, but rather a humiliation. So mm -hmm. I, I think that this, this, you know, on that, on this line, you know, uh, Jung, Jung's doctrine of individuation is spot on with the mainstream contemplative traditions. Hmm. Yeah, and maybe maybe it's maybe what the the shadow aspect that it's uh, highlighting for you in your judgment of others is actually some sort of kind of moralistic complex, uh, some kind of purity or or judgmental complex that you've got going on. That's maybe. right. And so, so yeah. suddenly, the people that really bug you are the greatest gifts in your life because only they can hold up the mirror. They're the only ones who will let you know. 
who you, who you, who, what, what aspects of yourself you need to come to terms with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of young, um, a friend of mine, uh, a little while ago, he's, uh, he's kind of a new psychotherapist. Um, and I think he's still trying to figure out like what kind of therapist he's going to be. And, um, so we talk about people like Jung and, and Hillman, folks like that quite a bit. He said to me, uh, called me up one day and he said, you know what? Jung is my religion. Like he like found it. Mm. And my immediate reaction was like, oh, whoa, whoa, like slow down. <laughs> and it kind of like shocked me to hear that. But then later, you know, it's like once you hear something, you see it everywhere or you start to hear it everywhere. And I, and I realized that this is, I think, uh, an idea that's going around is that Jungian psychology can be a replacement for religion because people are like rejecting particularly Christianity or whatever religion they inherited. Uh, and but this is like, oh, well, Jungian psychology or archetypal psychology in particular can give you everything that you get from religion and uh, without all of like the kind of the dogma and belief and all that stuff. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, I think you've certainly named something that's pervasive and Jungians in particular have been, are the source of this. Um, by Jungians, I mean, you know, trained analysts and who have, for whatever reason, found everything in their, psycho, psycho, their psychoanalytical practice. Jung himself is a little bit more subtle than that and typically pulls back from saying, I'm offering a substitute for religion. What he actually says is, I'm offering something for people who, for whatever reason, have no religion. And he specified Protestantism mm -hmm. because he thought Catholics, you know, they've got, they've got everything they need. They've got the devil, they've got Mary, they've got the crucified savior, and they've got redemption and the priest and the mass and the whole symbolic. Confession. Yeah. They, got, they don't need psychotherapy. So right. his candidate for psychotherapy was a sort of, what would we call a lapsed Protestant, you know, Pro a Protestant who no longer goes to church and just regards it as some kind of- <laughs> Like you know, himself. Practice. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, and and the, because, because Jung actually saw that there was something about European modernity, which was, um, uh, which needed this kind of treatment because of the, well, this is related to the secular, the, the moment of demythologization, the disenchantment of the world, the commodification of everything, the hegemony of te technology, um, the reduction of everything to quantity. The, the Jung is very keen, it's keenly sensitive to, the, to this as a massive psychological shift, at least in one portion of humanity. He didn't assume that everybody was going through this, uh, but he certainly saw that this is what was happening to, let's say, uh, Protestant Christendom, and mm -hmm. that this was a crisis, and that the because the mythic life, the symbolic life, which is a better term, mythic, you know, I, I prefer to talk about the symbolic life. We we need a symbolic life, and we need a symbolic life that's actually adequate to the fullness of our of our beings. So the the, the transcendent needs to be somehow uh, represented for us, however inadequately. And if it isn't, uh, you know curious and even pathological things will happen. Uh, so he was addressing that problem. And then I guess it's, it's somehow ironic that the upshot of it is that he suddenly becomes uh, a new form of religion, which it just doesn't work. It's, it's, not, it's, it's just not complete enough. It's, it's too shot through with scientism. It's, uh, it's, it, and there's a kind of hubris to it too to say that the, you know, the psychoanalysis has now kind of lifted us above the, the, the human religion, which is as old as human humanity, at least 200,000 years old. Now, now we have a better perspective. So we look down at all this. That's just rationalism, right? It's just an elevated form of rationalism. Yeah. No, I think that's true. I, I never quite thought of it that way, but it does seem hubristic because what uh, belief in psychology what it allows us to do is to kind of understand and deal with all the problematic aspects of life. Like all the questions can kind of be answered according to your own preferences in a way, mm. because psychology, there is no doctrine. Um, you can just kind of like pick and choose, you know, whatever mythological figures appeal to you, 
uh, whatever Greek gods and goddesses appeal to you, you just kind of like choose your own pantheon kind of thing. And it's, uh, it serves that narcissistic egocentric sin we were talking about, which is the well, one thing. Because there's no surrender. Right. That's right. It's the one thing that can stand between us and grace or Buddha nature um, is that sense that actually I'm in charge. And mm -hmm. that this is what disturbs me most about that Jungian psychology. Yeah. Know, like I'm in charge of my individuation process. Yeah. Uh, my analyst is like my priest substitute. I go do confession with them. I read Jung as, you know, reading of the scriptures kind of thing. But the piece of it that's lacking is the surrender to something greater. That's right. You know, someone yeah. might say, well, the big S self, I, I surrender to, or I surrender to psyche, psyche, I follow psyche or something. But I don't know. It still sounds contained in the individual to me. I mean, it's interesting to note how Jung had a great deal of trouble with that moment of surrender. Yeah, oh, that, that great story, almost like a parable uh, mm -hmm. of him not being able to touch his head to the ground, yes. uh, following his father's full surrender, right? To That's I think right. Protestant, uh, Protestant, you say it. <laughs> Protestantism, yeah. Protestantism, yes. I've never said that. And, when, I... and when, Jung, when Jung is really speaks personally about religion, he always pulls back and says, I'm a scientist. I don't believe. He might say, I don't believe I know. Um, or he'll say, I, I, I'm actually just speaking about facts. I'm doing science, whatever. And his, his real faith is in science. I mean, it's very strange to say because Jung is not regarded as the most rationally rigorous of thinkers, but he's got a, as much faith in science as does Freud. And this is a limitation, um, especially if we want to take him as a guide in matters that go beyond, let's say, psychotherapy. And there's a lot more to life than psychotherapy. I hope so. Yeah, like Hillman would say, like two people talking about their problems in a windowless room <laughs> as yeah. like the ship is sinking, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, what I'm, what that kind of makes me think about is, um, you know, that idea that Jung had and, you know, when things are encapsulated like this, it never captures the full context of how he talked about things, which is, I think, one of the problems with kind of dipping into Jung. Uh, a lot of his stuff is taken out of context and so then therefore misinterpreted. But one thing that he did talk about was how religion acted as a kind of buffer between us and the direct experience with the numinous or with God. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So all the rituals and dogma were actually a kind of protection from mm -hmm. us getting completely overwhelmed by that experience. Mm -hmm. And following like what we've been talking about, I think if we flip that around, that um, the psychology itself can be a kind of protection or defense against mm -hmm. um, the numinous experience in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. do you see that? Is that? I certainly, in the sense that we, you know, it leaves the the ego, the ego master of its house, or the self, which is just you know, one one wonders. Um, it's the inflated ego. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, that said, you know, I mean, these are difficult matters. I like very much what you said about the context, you know, the Jung's movement was a living practice. He was someone who was enmeshed in a community of thinkers and disciples, of course, and students. Uh, but it was a very, it, it was an, it was something that was really alive. And it, all of his writings were occasional writings, responses to something, you know, someone would ask him, oh, give us a paper on Mercurius. Yeah. And he's very reactive. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah he did. He, he's, he's not at all like Freud in that regard, but Freud, Freud would, you know, after eight hours of, of practicing analysis, he would write all evening, trying to master a kind of systematic overview of the metapsychology. And Freud is an incredible writer and systematician. Y Jung was not, not like this. And his editors actually recognized that, his, his uh, English editors. And they, they did something really strange. They said, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll put this systematic structure onto these occasional fragmentary writings hmm. so that we can show that he's every bit as systematic and rigorous a thinker as Freud's. And so you get the collected works of Jung, which read like, you know, um, some kind of uh, system, uh, but that's that's and many many pieces were left out. So there's a there's a scholarly reconstruction of Jung happening right now, which is quite exciting. And apparently, this what was left out is exceeds greatly what was included in the collected works. Hmm. Um, 
even the fact that the collected works are not even, they're not even put together chronologically actually, it just indicates something peculiar happening here. You know, so you have yeah. a volume of psychology and religion and it's pieces taken from all these different periods of context. <laughs> So, yeah, it does seem to be like someone's journal entries kind of all pasted together. Yeah. Like he's very stream of consciousness when he writes. He is, and he's but he's full of genius and he's full of insight, mm -hmm. and he's he's he belongs to our time in a very special way, and, and yeah. for that reason, I'm I'm not done I'm not done with him. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever be done with him. He's too too complicated and intriguing. Like he keeps drawing me back. Like even James Hillman, I find the same way. Mm. At some point, I just get so fed up with him that I um I put him away for a while. But then uh, I find myself being like kind of lured back mm. by some of his yeah, ideas. Right. Well, for me, Jung is what one of one of Jung's most important roles is that he can, maintains this link with the nineteenth century, the mm. rich history of nineteenth century romantic psychiatry, and behind that the whole history of um, European modernity from the Renaissance onward, you know, um, Jung keeps that alive. That, that's Jung's context, but Freud was deliberately shutting that down and replacing it with something that he thought was more rigorously scientific, his model of the psyche, which is emphatically not religious. Uh, Jung was a conservative movement to say, on the contrary, there's some there's a lot of psychoanalysis in 19th century German philosophy, for example, and German romanticism. The unconscious is a concept that's richly articulated and defined 100 years before Freud writes a single word. So Jung is maintaining that. You know, we mm. look at his collective unconscious theory, we think it's some kind of innovation. Every theory of the unconscious prior to Freud was the theory of the collective unconscious. Every single one that I know of. Freud was unique in personalizing and reducing the unconscious to the life of an individual. So what Jung was doing was showing, giving, giving it, his vote of allegiance to the tradition against mm. Freud. Yeah, I, I think uh, you highlight something that um, I found to be true is that Jung is like an incredible guide to the whole history of Western culture and its development right. and changes of consciousness within it. Like, everything's in there like he's willing to wrestle with the religious problem like post Nietzsche like God is dead okay well what are we going to do about that and what are the implications of that um, and then reporting on the ground you know during the world wars and post-war and kind of seeing into the future where it's all leading I mean incredible like the scope of his thinking the only person that I think comes even close is someone like Rudolf Steiner Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good comparison. They were they were contemporaries, although they had nothing to do with each other. I know, like, look, they had to have met or been thinking about each other, but I haven't been finding any evidence that there's been any interaction. But I can't believe that. Like, were their well, ethos just I, too great that they were like, I'm staying away from that guy? Yes. Yeah. And their 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 movements were in competition. Yeah. It it was not ignorance of each other. It was actually avoidance of each other. But you know what you say makes me think that the, the, the person for whom, the person that whose only religious guide in life is Jung is really not doing that badly. Because through Jung, you can find your way into everything. And if, if Jung is their gateway into the history of the West, um, you know, right back to, you know, ancient Gnosticism, yeah. well, that's not so bad. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But I think the thing is, you have to go all the way with him. Like when yes. he said, you don't understand anything about my psychology until you've read the Bible. Yeah. So how many of those people following Jung are going yeah. past reading the black books or the red book or whatever and getting kind of enthralled with these images and the story of this guy going through this journey to the unconscious of ah, and actually going back and reading the Bible, reading, you know, the, the Gnostic stuff or whatever, um, like going back to the source text, which I think Jung would say, look, you have to go back to the source. You can't just get it all through me. They read the answer to Job, but they don't read the book of Job. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mm. Or they listen to Jordan Peterson talk about Jung's answer to Job. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like three steps removed now. Oh, yeah. But this is, we're, we're, we're in a time of great illiteracy and great decline. And uh, I think that that we're, what we're one of the things we're touching on here is how how rich and nuanced and uh, complex European intellectual life was in the middle of the 20th century compared to mm -hmm. what we're dealing with now. <sighs> The sound bite, sound bite culture, and it's it's something that can't be avoided. It's it's too big. It has to do with technology and media, 
on the one hand, it's wonderful. There's so much information and there's so many ways in which one can constitute a community for themselves and cultivate their interests. But on the other hand, there is a kind of uh, degeneration of, of, uh, of, of common literacy. And mm -hmm. I think that this is, uh, this is why I think, you know, Jung is not the worst thing in the world. Yeah, no, that's true, because he does, in a way, help to curate your education. That's um, it. I'm, I've been studying with uh, Thomas More, who you have maybe some things in common with, actually, you know, he was uh, a monastic for mm -hmm. early part of his life and uh, got out of it. And, yeah. uh, but so I've been studying with him for a while now. And one of the things I appreciate most about it is that he's like someone that I trust as an elder and he's doing a basically what he's doing is curating an education for us. Mm -hmm. um, he's not delivering it so much as kind of like pointing to some very mm -hmm. specific texts and people say like, if you're interested in this, kind of check this stuff out. And uh, what that does is put a lot of the burden of the education on me is to follow up on those leads mm -hmm. and then, you know, enter down these cavernous rabbit holes you know like you point mm -hmm. to like hillman all of a sudden you're like oh my god you're wrestling with hillman one day and then you're wrestling with uh, i don't know heraclitus or epicurus the next day you know so it's a lifelong education but it's so helpful to have someone um give those pointers you know like these yeah, people are on our tree if you're interested in this tree and what we're talking about generally hillman thomas moore um, to some degree, Peterson, Peterson certainly C.G. Jung is the recovery of the spirituality of the West. And this is so important because we know so much about the East now. And many of us have been so, so, so transformed by our experiences with the East, with, with yoga, with Buddhism, and also with the North and the South, with shamanism. We, have, we are now all very religiously literate in a certain way. Uh, but the one thing that we don't know very much about is our own tradition. And there's a psychological problem there mm -hmm. uh, because we might be chasing after figures and teachers who really are not meant for us in the sense that they can't really touch the depths of our being. For me, for example, uh, you know, Jesus is um, a Western shaman and Christ is a European bodhisattva. And he is the one given to post-Western uh, society. All right. That's the, there's a place of power there that I suspect will have, well, could have more effect on, a, on an individual's life than, uh, than uh, you know, um, anything that you'll find elsewhere, if only because of, uh, you know, the, the reality of our cultural heritage, of our collective yeah. unconscious, if you wish, which is, which is localized in a certain way. We're not yeah. just all lost in the sea. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No, I, that's so I really great. appreciate Jung for, for doing this. And he said, mm. this is my task. He, he traveled to India and he realized, he had a dream, I think, of the Christ. And he realized my task actually is to not to recover uh, a you know, global religiosity, but actually to be the psychoanalyst of Western religion. Mm. And for and for that reason, his his uh, he, because he saw the the problem there, he saw the the illness there. Well, and and being active in that time of the the theosophists and the anthroposophists, mm -hmm. he saw what all of that kind of cultural cherry picking what that could lead to. Mm -hmm. You know, he must have known about Alistair Crowley too. You know, mm -hmm. like certainly, certainly was... Crowley knew about him. Crowley wrote an interesting review of his first book. Really interesting review. Jung's first book was called "The Symbols of Transformation," yeah. and it's a it's a it's a very scholarly and peculiar book in which he offers an alternative reading of libido than Freud. And this is when Freud realized this guy can't be my follower because uh, Freudian libido was uh, uh, sexual and deviates from sexuality in perversions, but Jungian libido was sort of Life force. Uh, amorphous. Yeah, it was life force. It was, it was just a direction towards any possible goal in some respects. And so Crowley mm -hmm. picks up on this and he says, this guy, C.G. Jung, this is like in 1912, I think, a review. C.G. Jung has broken through, through this new science of psychoanalysis, which is probably pseudo, like most of the new things. He's broken through to the old magical idea of will. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. Mm. 
Because mm. that's, that's that, that connection that I was talking about. Jung as the conservative who's retaining this link back to the Renaissance and deeper, of course, uh, to a practice of transformation of spirituality, which is European mm. and which might be the medicine we need. Yeah. Um, just going back a step or two, uh, you know, I think I think you're absolutely right. Like Christ is what we were given. There's something so specific about that. And what I've been thinking about lately, coming out of my own experience of this like encounter with the Christ, this unexpected encounter that um, forced me to, to wrestle with the whole Christian thing. Um, what I've been thinking about is that Christianity is like in my genes. And I think in a lot of us moderns, it's like a latent potential, like epigenetics, you know, how other characteristics are passed on through <clears throat> the lineage, and they may be lying dormant uh, until something comes along to activate it. Like mm -hmm. a cancer cell, breast cancer is one example of how that gets carried on, but doesn't, doesn't necessarily get activated in the person. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's lying there as a potential. And for me, having this activated through exploration of yoga and plant medicine shamanism in South America, what it activated was not some kind of pagan belief in mother ayahuasca or Shakti in particular, uh, but specifically this Christ figure or being or force, you know, I'm still trying to understand, trying to understand, um, the relationship between Jesus Christ, the person, and what I've experienced as some kind of Christ power or Christ force that's in the world, maybe starting to get hints that maybe what I've been trying to think of is what they call the word or logos. That's right. Really hard to define thing. Like Peterson, I think, just uh, reduces it too much to something like order. But uh, what I've been thinking about it more of as following maybe in um, John, it's like almost like a Shakti, like it's the, mm -hmm. the creative force in the universe. That everything in creation has come through this. That's right. Through, all through him, all things were made. Well, what this question is the question of Christianity. So those councils that I talked about, and I see uh, Chalcedon, this was their question as well. What is the relationship of the logos to, the, to Jesus, to the man? So mm -hmm. it's the very heart of the whole thing. But I, I, it touches on something that I wanted to share with you because I was thinking a lot about this in anticipation of this discussion. Let me just have a look at what I wrote here. Yeah, Christ in Paul and John is a cosmic power before it is a savior messiah. It's the one word of the father. So the image of the invisible God through whom all things are created. That's a quote from Colossians. Or it's the light of all people, John says. Another quote from the first letter of John, the true light which enlightens everyone, or the word of life. And the Christian Platonists called it the form of forms. The logos was sort of like this, uh, the, yeah, the form of forms. Every, everything in the world is patterned off a form, and all these forms are patterned off one form. So it's, a, you know, it's as though God speaks one word, and the word is his son, and in this one word, all things are spoken. That is the, uh, that is mm. the, the orthodox tradition of Christology. And then the question of who Jesus is in relationship to the Christ is the, you know, that's the big dispute that animates the whole thing and moves it forward right into to the day, to today. But I mean, one of the things that uh, that's clear is that if, you know, the Christ is the Logos, he's not a god. He's not like Zeus or Carnunos or Mercurius or Hermes. These are creatures, you know, these are forms. Yeah. He's the form of all forms. So he's, he's, we could speak of Christ nature. I'm, I'm thinking about this as kind of riff on Buddha nature, because I love the concept of Buddha nature. Christ nature, much closer to logos than this personalization of Christ as a god like Zeus or something, or Hermes, right? They're all finite. Uh, and now, of course, there is an essential relationship to the man Jesus, but they're not mm. identical. Mm. Yeah, well... The Christ nature idea, I mean, I think something like that uh, was picked up by people like um, Yogananda, who was a yogi, came to the West, uh, realized, recognized that he was 
dealing with the Christian culture and so incorporated Christianity into his, uh, his yoga. Uh, and so he would talk about uh, Christ consciousness. Yes, that's close. Yeah. Yeah. But what does I that think... mean? Does that mean like when I'm full of Christ consciousness, I'm, I'm just full of love and compassion for all beings? I, I think the Christ as the power is much more than that. Certainly is. I mean, I, the identification with consciousness causes me to kind of take a step back uh, because well, the I light think, in all things. Yeah, the light in all things, the light and the life. Right. Well, what, what does this Christ nature do? We could ask ourselves that. What does the logos do? Well, it brings things together. It is the power of love and transformation. It brings knowledge. It brings freedom. It brings life. It brings life, and it well, it brings everything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Keep going, yes. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Does it bring suffering too? I, in, in a certain way, uh, it's, well, it's, it's deeply bound up with suffering, isn't it? Because the Christ nature incarnates amongst us. And what does he do but suffer? Mm -hmm. Almost as the though the, ent yeah, the entrance of the Christ nature into appearance, into full manifestation, can only mean crucifixion. And was that something like a, a kind of a, a birth pain, though, like his suffering was necessary in the beginning so that we didn't have to suffer so much? And it's only our um, our distance from Christ's nature that causes our suffering. Certainly, but yeah, I mean, and, our, we and our suffering can't be compared to his, you know. We have to get, you know, we have to get technical and metaphysical, just as the Buddhists and the Hindus have to when we they're talking about these great mysteries, right? So we have to talk about sin. We have to talk about the fallen world. We have to talk about a world that is opposed to the good. And this is a thought that's somewhat difficult for more monistically inclined thinkers. Uh, but we have to think uh, of evil as um, as real, you know, as something uh, that is uh, actively pursuing. Our destruction and the christ nature overcomes this this is the yeah. cosmic battle that paul announces the battle has been won it's almost like there's a cosmic power a, a cosmic power battle happening and it's been won for us and now we no longer have to worry and nothing can nothing can stand in the way of us and love and with this kind of belief and trust in the overwhelming power of the christ nature to vanquish death and the powers of death. With this trust in it, we become transformed. We become Christ men, Christ women. We become capable of things that we could not, could never have achieved on our self power. Therein lies the whole story of Christianity. It's a story mm -hmm. of saints and mystics uh, understanding this fundamental point. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, I'm thinking now about how Jung wrestled with the idea of evil in Christianity and the, the notion of um, privatio boni, that mm -hmm. uh, the evil in itself doesn't have any substance, but evil is only the absence of the good. Yeah. And I know like he had a problem with that idea. He thought evil was a force in the universe. I tend to agree, but I don't think that those things have to be uh, opposing to each other. So like, if there's an absence of good, maybe that just leaves an opening for evil to enter and to maybe take over and influence through people and their actions. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, the whole debate around Provazio Boni. And the one thing worth noting is that Provazio Boni is a, is a platonic concept and fully fully originates in a non-Christian context. So when Paul talks about it, this cosmic battle, battle, he's not thinking about evil as a privation of goodness at all. But the other point though is that, and this is where Provazio has something to offer us, is the complete disproportion between good and evil. So the light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't even comprehend it. So the, we're not talking about you know, this battle, this George Lucas battle between the good side and the dark side of the force. Evil is, is, seems to be something, some mis mystery that's permitted to occur for reasons that we do not understand and that is bound up with our, uh, our salvation and our transformation. That's why it exists. Like going back to what we were talking about before, the, the sin has to precede the, the, the salvation. Right. That's right. And the so, sin is, a, you know, what, what's the cause of sin? 
well, evil, right? No? So there's an, ancient, there's, an ancient prayer, there's an ancient prayer that's sung at the Easter liturgy on Saturday called the Exultant. And it contains a theological error, something that's been regarded as a heresy, but it's sung in every uh, Catholic church on Holy Saturday. And the line goes, oh, happy fault of Adam, oh, necessary sin that earned for us so great a redeemer. <laughs> That's an error? That sounds right on to me. Yeah, well, it's, it's been recognized that, you know, we don't, sin is not necessary so that good uh, should occur. Oh, right. For people who subscribe yeah. to Privatio Boni. Yeah, that's right. Well, just so like the all... line in the Lord's Prayer, right? Like, lead me not into temptation. That's well, right. wait a minute. God is capable of leading us into temptation? Like, what does that say about God? Right. <laughs> Yeah, we just, I just had a conversation with somebody about that, with Don Carvitha about it. I, I understand the point of that prayer to be without God's support, which we always have, and we can always rely on, but were it not there, we'd fall immediately into temptation. Mm -hmm. In other words, the only thing that keeps us from falling to pieces and following the wrong spirit is the power of God. And so in other words, it's a way of saying everything depends on you, and I recognize that. Is that a good translation of the original? I'm, I'm guessing that it was probably Greek in its origin or well, Latin. I guess, I guess it would have been Aramaic. It's one of the, 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 the oh yeah, the right. Lord's Prayer is one of those. That's in the book. That, that one of those pieces the biblical <laughs> scholars will allow us to be uh, probably in some form out of the mouth of Jesus himself. And so I don't, I'm not a scholar of Aramaic, so I won't say, but one can recognize the compatibility of the idea of temptation. Um, Christ is, What's the first thing that happens when Jesus appears on the River Jordan, which is probably the first historical appearance, the nativity being uh, something added after and constructed. Uh, you know, Jesus's historical appearance is as a follower of John the Baptist gets baptized in the Jordan River. First thing that happens is there's a revelation and a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son. And then the beloved son is led into the desert where he's tempted by the devil. So there's a kind of immediate confrontation, immediate, you know, there's the, the evil one is where the holy one is, not because mm -hmm. they're the same, they're not the same, but there's but the holy one system. consolates the evil one. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they belong together. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're, belong to, they're, they're bound up with each other because the mystery of the existence of the evil one is bound up with this path of salvation. So he hates him. He hates him because he knows he shall be rendered a mere means to something greater that he can understand or that he can will. Um, but he also knows that this is the, you know, this is the reason for his existence in a certain way. So the devil dogs the Christ right to the end. Hmm. This is like Jung's, pro Jung's problem with the Trinity is that it left out the adversary and he saw that um, just like the cross that um, it shouldn't be a Trinity, it should be a quaternio, which he thought was the symbol of wholeness. That uh, it goes something like father at the top, son, adversary, and then the opposites uh, reconciled in the Holy Spirit. I think that's brilliant. I think what's right about it is that quaternity is a symbol of wholeness. But what's wrong about it is that is to assume Trinity is meant to be a symbol of wholeness. And mm. also to assume that all these things are excluded, because as you remember, it's not just the devil that's excluded, it's also Mary. It's Mary, it's matter, it's all, all these, all this stuff. And the Trinity is the symbol of God in God's self. And there always is a fourth which is creation. God and creation is the whole. The fourth is creation. And it's, it's in creation that you find Mary and the devil, who's also a creature. Hmm. He's, a crea he's, he's a fallen angel. So he starts as a, a being produced by God, right? Hmm. Now, is that, um, is that spelled out directly anywhere? Is this just kind of like um, something like a supposition? Um, this, this is my uh, uh, conclusion after wrestling with Jung on the Trinity for a while, for a long while, and reading the Trinitarian theologians and uh, believing them for, for uh, on logical grounds, really, rather than Jung, that the Trinity, the, the devil doesn't belong within the Godhead. The devil belongs within the whole, and the whole is a, a quaternity, and the, but that devil isn't 
it's not just the devil who's the fourth, it's creation, that which is yeah. other than God, which God allows to be. Why does God create? And this is the great mystery. Does he need creation? This is a great debate. In any case, he wills that it should be, that there should be other something other than himself. That constellates the fourth. The Trinity wills that there should be something other than itself. It constitutes the fourth, the other. And within this otherness, you know, all these other features that we're discussing appear, including, you know, femininity, passivity. We're not allowed to right. speak the way Jung spoke about women. But you know, for him, that was an important yeah, the thing. The irrational and all the that. The irrational, yeah. the feet, the, but the bodily, the material, the corrupting, the corrupt, the thing that's things that fall apart, you know, the blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> that was this Gnosticism showing, I think. <laughs> I think so. I think I think that this is the crucial point where where Orthodox uh, Christianity, I do mean by that the ancient Christianity, has a better solution to the problem of wholeness and quaternity, which is namely that Trinity plus creation is. The that, whole. Yeah, I mean, that itself uh, lands really well for me, that the Trinity is not meant to be a symbol of wholeness. Yes, the Quaternio is a symbol of wholeness, but the Trinity is not meant to be that and missing one of its limbs or something. That's right. Hmm. It, 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 we have to be careful because we can't, I mean, this is a difficult issue, but why does what is the relationship of the Trinity to the fourth, to the other, to creation? Does it need creation to be whole? Are we saying that God is not whole? Um, that's not what we're saying. The relationship of God to creation is, is a relation of freedom, a relationship of freedom. And, and for this reason, the fourth has this anarchic and chaotic quality to it, productive hmm. of things that God does not desire, but which he permits, such as the mm -hmm. evil. Well, I think the image of the cross um yeah the 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 fourth limb the base of it is stuck in the earth that's right and I often mean, it's the, it's uh, all the, there yeah. like it what's is. visible to us is really the three the horizontal beam and the top but the fourth is is in the earth like it's underneath your feet kind of I think that's right. Maybe well, the, the, the cross <laughs> itself is a fourth when, you know, the truth, the, the, there's an old uh, theological principle that the work of any one persons of the Trinity is also the work of the others. So if the son dies on the cross, well, in some respects, the father and the spirit are also there dying on the cross. So the Trinity is on the cross, but the cross is not part of the Trinity. The cross is the fourth, right? And, and, and the symbol, the symbolism of that is so powerful. So that you know he becomes one of us he becomes identical with a fallen and rebellious creation for for the sake of overcoming darkness death and destruction hmm. this is why if, if if someone doesn't believe there is such thing a thing as evil active in the world there's really very little way of bringing the gospel to them and i i don't know what to say other than you know they must read different news than me. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but and I think this is something of what Jung was in a very clumsy way getting at when he said the privatio tradition is diminishing the psychological reality of evil. And I think yeah. that was the case, maybe in 50s yeah. scholastic Catholicism. Uh, maybe I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. think it is anymore. Yeah. Again, I. You know, I kind of reread some of those passages uh, leading up to this conversation just to get refreshed on his position on these things. But uh, again, I think it's one of those things that's been kind of reduced and distilled a little too much. Um, when you get into him, like even uh, the, you know, the problem of Christ as an archetype, he didn't come out and really say that, you know, maybe Edinger kind of followed up and made that a little more concrete. Uh, mm. But Jung was very much more ambivalent about Christ as an archetype. Mm. What he said is that uh, people projected the archetype onto the Christ, you know, mm. the archetype that was within them. Um, but yeah, well, look, we could keep talking all day long. And I really appreciate your uh, generosity and having this conversation with me and, and kind of going there with me. Um, Maybe uh, we could have another conversation down the road. I'm sure there's going to be more things I want to pick your brain about. No, I, I very much appreciated the invitation, the opportunity. You know, these are matters that are still deeply alive for me. So it's a, it's a pleasure and a joy to talk to you about them. 
Yeah, that's great. I mean, your position too, you know, being, um, you know, like 10 years older than me, uh, but being steeped in this much longer, particularly the, the Christian tradition, um, I find like the way you put things together and also your understanding of the psychological and not uh, discarding that um, is really helpful to me. It's, uh, it's helping me along my path and uh, in my continue, continual wrestling with this Christian thing. Um, still trying to figure it out, but you're helping me. So I'm sure you're helping other people too. Well, and one thing that is like... going, yeah. One thing just to say that I know is going on out there, because as I've been producing podcasts and writing a bit more about my own journey with kind of my reckoning with Christianity, is that a lot of other people are going through it too. And um, maybe starting to come out of the closet in a way. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. I'd like to know more about that. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't su surprise me at all if the great, the next fit move, the next moment for Christianity comes completely from outside the institutional churches. That would surprise, that's what I expect. That was on, in my notes actually, is to mm. ask you your take on um, the kind of current trend of people converting to specifically Catholicism and orthodoxy. Like a lot of people around our age, Gen Xers who had, maybe refused Christianity early on in favor of yoga, shamanism, uh, eco-activism, you know, like Paul King's North. When they come back, they come back hard and they, they kind of mm. come back to the old institutions. And I'm like, I'm not sure, so sure that that's the right move at this time. Um, mm. And I, I, what's kind of alive in me is like wondering, well, I feel like it's coming back, but it's got to find like a new form. Like it's like the new, it needs to have the new wine skin, right? right. To use that analogy. I think the, I, I, the institutions have spent themselves and they're not, they're, they're, they're wonderful things, but they're monuments to the past. The spirit is for the most part, not there, which isn't to say totally. that there's no spirit in the world. It just means that it's moved. It's moved as it has been moving for 2000 years or since the beginning. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's been my feeling too. Uh, the way I thought of it, I mean, I, I remember going to uh, Grace Cathedral in San Francisco a number of years ago. Ironically, there I was there to teach yoga. <laughs> and it was Easter Sunday, and I wanted to go to one of the great cathedrals in North America, right? And I remember going in, and, you know, amazing, just amazing place. I thought, this is a religious machine from the stained glass to the incredible pipe organ, just the, the whole architecture of the place, it was like meant to produce a religious experience. That's exactly right, yeah. And, and this cathedral in particular, I found uh, really interesting as a, as a yogic person, because they had a labyrinth inlaid in the, in the floor. Amazing. Mm. In like the main hall, like it was like central. But, and this to me was so illustrative of where the churches have kind of lost their way. Instead of having that labyrinth open to people to come in and walk around and contemplate, it had a bunch of folding chairs on top of it so that people could sit there and listen to the kind of pre-recorded liturgy or whatever, you yeah. know? And I was like, this is the whole problem. It's like, you've got this That's incredible right. religious machine and we've lost the user manual for it or something. Well, that's the, that's the forgetting of contemplation that we were talking about. You know, people yeah. just be still and let the architecture and the symbols speak as they, they still do. To say that it's of the past isn't to devalue it at all. You know, where, where would we be with our, our ancient temples? I'm sure you've been to a few. Um, they, they stand for us as uh, they're the ground of our present existence and they still have a role to play, which isn't to say that um, if they can, they, they, they've never been able to, they don't confine the spirit. They never did. And there, it's interesting, I and mean, another time we could talk about how Orthodox theology has always recognized that the spirit goes where it wants and that we don't have charge of it. Even the business of recognizing saints, you know, when the Pope recognizes a saint, what he does is he listens to see where the buzz is. Oh, there's a group of people making a big fuss about somebody over in Mexico. Oh, and looks, looks like he's performing miracles, this guy. And then the Vatican goes to see, to recognize. So they don't define the saint. Well, because sometimes the, the people who are sainted are, could be 
kind of considered quite problematic for the church. No, many, of them, many of them are, are very problematic <laughs> and borderline and bizarre, you know. And so oh, it's just one, one of many places. But we can't we can't presume uh, to be the author of this great mystery. And I think the church and its its most sound theology has always recognized that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like what you said. The church doesn't contain it. Maybe the other part of that is it just um, uh, kind of like brings to the forefront or intensifies the spirit in a way or mm -hmm. outlines it in a particular way that, ah, oh, we can recognize it. Yeah, it, more it announces easily. it. It proclaims it. It blows right, a trumpet, builds yeah. a church, paints a picture, writes a symphony. But yeah. it's always response. It's not production. Yeah, and not containment. Yeah. Uh, this has been so great. Um, Sean, I mean, okay, here's final question. For someone like me, right? Explored Eastern religions, shamanism, things like that, kind of compelled to re-explore Christianity, or maybe it's the first time. So someone with a more contemplative or experiential, mystical inclination, who are some of the the writers that you would um, point them to, you know, kind of classic writers, like well-established or well-revered? Well, I wouldn't know anything about any of this if it wasn't for Thomas Merton. I, I, I think Thomas Merton is one of the most important uh, Christian writers of the modern era, and he wrote a lot. Hmm. So, um, and he's a wonderful writer. And he's an honest, honest writer. And he had his journey to the East and he had his fall from grace and all of that. He's just, uh, he was compelled to, to chronicle his whole religious life, which he did. And his journals are extraordinary. His journals are the best part of his work. Hmm. And there's, I think, there, I don't know how many volumes of journals there are. So, I mean, I, as a, it depends, you know, writing is so difficult. It depends on what people are looking for. Some people want arguments, you know. Merton doesn't give us arguments. There are other great figures. You know, G.K. Chesterton has some withering arguments against positivism and scientism that are extremely funny and uh, they can be really powerful for people. It depends on what somebody needs. If somebody needs their mind convinced, they go to a different author. But in terms of the, 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 uh, well, the contemplative Christian reawakening, I don't think you can go wrong with Merton. Yeah, well, what speaks to me, and I think to a lot of the people who I know and I meet in the spiritual scene, seekers, is the confessional, is not coming mm -hmm. from an authoritative position telling you how it is, mm -hmm. but telling you more what it was like for me and including sure. the parts where they were wrestling or uncertain or the um, falls from grace or the disillusionments. I think people want to be able to relate to some of these writers and thinkers in a very personal way. Yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah. Good. There are so, a few others, but Merton, um, and when one sees his voice change, you know, he enters the strictest religious order in the world in the 40s, and he dies in uh, Bangkok in 68 at a conference on Marxism, where he's on this journey to visit all the great Eastern sages, including the young Dalai Lama. And wow. the, the transformation of his voice over that period is fascinating, fascinating to watch. Yeah. Okay. He was only 53 when he died, so I've already yeah. outlived him. <laughs> so um, what's a good place to start with Merton? Well, for you, I would pick up the Asian journals of Thomas Merton. All right. So cool. they, the order finally let him go, and he went and he traveled to, uh, throughout India and uh, uh, Asia to some degree. Did he get to Japan? I don't think he did. Uh, thinking about East-West and the meaning of these symbols. And the, his description of the experience of the Buddhas, the great stone Buddhas in Palinarua and Sri Lanka. Is, yeah, it's just amazing. Just be beautiful, beautiful writing. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. A pleasure. And thanks for the reaching out, Brian. Enjoyed yeah, the chat very much. Yeah, hopefully we can do it again soon. Take care. Take care. Cheers. The Medicine Path is produced by Brian James on unceded Coast Salish territory, Vancouver Island, Canada. For more information, visit brianjames.ca. Music by Olive Artizoni, a.k.a. Greenhouse. Join the Medicine Path tribe and gain early access to episodes and the full podcast archives at patreon.com 
forward slash medicine path. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall soft upon your fields. Until the next time we meet on the medicine path.